Vanderbilt Hall at Harvard Medical School in Boston, celebrating 75 years since Saul Hertz asked the critical question to President Compton from MIT, could iodine be made radioactive artificially? Saul Hertz's daughter was just a young child when her father passed in 1950. She was told of his pioneering work in medicine, but had limited knowledge beyond that. Today, she appreciates his profound contribution to the diagnosis and treatment of thyroid diseases and the paradigm change it represents. Preserved in the attic of her childhood home were boxes of correspondence, the handwritten data charts of the very first series of patients treated with radioactive iodine, journals and newspaper articles. Here on display is Dr. Saul Hertz's work documenting him as the first and foremost person to develop the experimental data on radioactive iodine and apply it to the clinical setting. Radioactive iodine is a tracer, a treatment for hyperthyroidism and the first targeted cancer therapy. Several prominent thyroid specialists and medical historians, including Jeffrey Mifflin, archivist with Mass General Hospital, have helped to review and organize this treasure. Saul Hertz was born on April 20th, 1905 in Cleveland, Ohio, to Orthodox Jews who had fled Europe. He graduated from the University of Michigan with Phi Beta Kappa honors. In 1929, he received his MD from Harvard Medical School, followed by an internship and residency at Cleveland's Mount Sinai Hospital. He came back to Boston to join the newly formed thyroid clinic at the Massachusetts General Hospital in 1931. It should be noted that he was a Dalton scholar and that Jewish doctors were not allowed on the staff at that time. Barbara Hertz assembled this exhibit in Vanderbilt Hall at Harvard Medical School, which is the exact location where Dr. Saul Hertz originally asked the question that began the research. She spoke with Dr. Richard Wien from Tufts Medical Center to bring to light how this discovery has impacted thyroid patients today. It was nice to get an invitation to come to this kind of an event as a surgeon, which is non-traditional, which is nice, because the patients that I operate on benefit immensely from adjuvant radioactive iodine. The, the, the role that radioactive iodine plays in my patients, not only diagnostically, but also therapeutically, is huge. So for myself to see where it all started, the origins of this, and also see that it's rooted right here in Boston is, is very interesting. Yeah. As much as we may do a total thyroidectomy and, and feel that we removed every bit of cancer or every bit of thyroid, it's almost like the, the analogy I make to a lot of patients is like taking peanut butter off an English muffin. <laughs> you can get most of it off, but there's a little bit left behind. That little bit, that little bit of uptake yeah. is where radioactive iodine comes in to be critical as far as the treatment of patients with head and cancer, especially thyroid cancer. During this exhibit, Barbara, and also Drs. Braverman and Garber, had the opportunity to speak about Dr. Saul Hertz and some of the impact his work has had even today. How did Saul Hertz make a difference? He was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1905 to immigrant Orthodox Jews. After high school, he went to the University of Michigan, graduating Phi Beta Kappa. He was most fortunate to attend Harvard Medical School in that there were quotas for Jews in those days. He graduated in 1929 and returned to Cleveland to complete his internship and residency. In 1931, he came back to Boston to the Mass General Hospital to work under the direction of their chief of medicine, Dr. James Howard Means. Dr. Means had established the thyroid clinic at MGH in 1920. Dr. Means um, also was interested in um, diversifying, I guess, his, his group, and he was open-minded enough to hire a Jewish doctor. About five years later, he hired the first woman doctor at Mass General. Shortly after, Means appointed her, Dr. Hertz as the chief of the thyroid clinic. Some 75 years ago, right here in Vanderbilt Hall, on November 12, 1936, MIT's President Compton spoke on the topic, What Physics Can Do for Biology and Medicine. With Dr. Means, his boss, standing right next to him, after the presentation, Dr. Hertz asked, Could iodine be made radioactive artificially? 
you may have noticed the posters with two letters. One with a response from President Compton's, um, President Compton um, to the question, describing the qualities of radioactive iodine. And the other to Dr. Compton, um, suggesting that they may have some animal studies. Dr. Mean's letter to Archie Woods, who was, the Mary Markle found in, who was with the Mary Markle Foundation in New York, states, it at once occurred to Hertz, referring to Saul Hertz asking the question to President Compton. This is an important point because further down the line, it, the waters became very muddy as to who and how Saul Hertz's seminal question was asked. The Markle Foundation, to whom Dr. Means was corresponding, funded the building of MIT's cyclotron. See what $30,000 could buy you back in the day? Early in 1937, a collaboration between MIT and Mass General Hospital was established. Dr. Arthur Roberts, a young Jewish physicist, was selected. As a condition for Roberts' employment at MIT, the director of MIT's lab, Robley Evans, insisted that the director's name be put on published papers. When Roberts got to MIT, he did all the work. Uh, let's see. With Hertz and Robert as a team, they did rabbit studies. Roberts figured out how to make, extract, and concentrate radioactive iodine based on Fermi's work. I-128 was produced. He also set up a counting apparatus based on the Geiger-Muller counter to do the measuring. The rabbit studies demonstrated the radioactive iodine <coughs> tracer qualities, a profound step forward in the field of nuclear medicine. Now came the conflict. When the paper was submitted for publication, just Hertz and Robert's names were, were on it. The director of MIT's lab, Robley Evans, stood over Hertz and dictated a letter to be sent to the editor so that his name could be added, although his contribution was negligible. Dr. Robert's letter to the author of a book about the history of MGH thyroid unit, in his letter he writes, furthermore, he had every opportunity and certainly authority to have taken an active part in the work, but he chose not to do so. I do not know why, but it may be, in view of his known anti-Semitism, that he could not stomach the notion of working with two Jews. Early in 1941, Hertz administered the first atomic cocktail of MIT cyclotron-produced iodine-131 to Elizabeth D. at Mass General Hospital. You may have seen the data boards over there of the first 29 patients. Means are required that stable iodine begin one to three days after the radioactive iodine treatment. This was another issue that would foreshadow trouble. World War II came along, and Hertz joined the Navy in the Manhattan Project in medicine. MIT's Robley Evans, the lab's director, wrote a glowing recommendation saying, Dr. Hertz is the originator of the new techniques. While serving his country, Dr. Earl Chapman took over Hertz's cases at MGH. He decided to tweak the dosage. MIT Dr. Roberts, Hertz's collaborator, comments in his letter, Chapman, whose self-interest is obvious and who bungled, whether deliberately or not, follow-ups on Hertz's original series when Hertz joined the Navy, indicates how Dr. Chapman was undermining Hertz. The letters between Hertz and Chapman went back and forth, building tension. The end of the war draws near. Hertz writes to MIT's present content with two significant suggestions. I have certain ideas about the field of cancer. And I have proposed to Roberts that we plan a course in physical applications 
to biology and medicine and have drawn up a brief prospectus. When Hertz comes back to Boston, he's wedged out of Mass General Hospital. Chapman and Evans are now a solid team. A good deal of money has been made in that they have access to the cyclotron produced radioactive iodine and the government is moving slowly to distribute RAI off the atomic stockpile. So much for honoring and serving your country during the most important years of your career. And Roberts leaves MIT. Hertz goes to the Beth Israel Hospital. He's there but a few months when he gets a phone call from the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association. Saul, he says, I have a paper here for publication from Mass General. And Earl Chapman and Robley Evans are saying they have propriety over radioactive iodine. And your name isn't even on the paper. The editor asks, what is going on here? The Journal of the American Medical Association's issue, May 11th, 1946, printed both articles. Both proved radioactive iodine was an effective treatment. Dr. Roberts writes, it was only later that I fully realized what a thoroughly unprincipled racist manipulator he, referring to Rob Robley Evans, was. His particular talent was taking all the credit for the work of others had done. He was abetted in this by Chapman. They did their best to denigrate the initial series of patients that Hertz treated, but were eventually unsuccessful. Dr. Hertz went on to do significant work in the cancer area. You may see from some of the newspaper articles that have posted that he met with success. His family money established the Radioactive Isotope Research in Institute. His brother Roy joined him as well. Dr. Sedlin in New York City and a physicist, Dr. Nelson. They had clinical and lab facilities both on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston and Fifth Avenue in New York. Dr. Hertz stated in a newspaper article that the foundation will apply the products of atomic fission to malignant growth. So here you have it. Even with all the challenges, Saul Hertz kept true to his passion. He left the legacy of millions of thyroid patients being treated with radioactive iodine, setting a cornerstone in the field of nuclear medicine, utilizing radioactive iodine in the treatment of cancer, and for sure having an effect on his brother Roy, who went on in cancer research at NIH to help find a cure for a cancerous tumor. His teaching was important to him too. He directly influenced curriculum development particularly at MIT and Harvard. Most importantly, he left a legacy of innovation and the spirit of collaboration in the sciences. So please join me in saying thank you and mazel tov. I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Garbers and Braverman, who can speak to the science behind his pioneering work, and to you, who are playing his dream forward. Thank you. So I won't say very much, but I think that if one wanted to confirm the historical perspective that you heard, if you went to a library and found this book, The Thyroid and Its Diseases by Means, the second edition, this was a book dedicated to the work of the MGH in the area of the thyroid. Dr. Braverman, who is and unarguably the editor of the foremost current thyroid textbook, Werner and Ingbar, a textbook in his ninth edition, postdated this in its initiation. That came out in the early 50s, and this started in 1937. So I just want to read a short section to you from the second edition, the introduction, which makes it unequivocal that at least from Means' point of view, anybody in authority knew who started radioiodine therapy. And basically, in this first page, within the first paragraph, of well, the forward, it says, the thyroid clinic at MGH has made active use of these 
and it's been particularly fortunate to have some of the original contributors among its membership and close association with workers with special skills in other institutions. Saul Hertz, for example, with Arthur Roberts in the physics department of MIT introduced the use of radioactive iodine for the study of thyroid physiology and the treatment of certain thyroid diseases in 1938. And there's no mention of the other author's um, contribution to the initiation of radioiodine therapy. Then if you go to the chapter on radioiodine therapy, it actually reads like a review article, radioiodine, saying, induced radioactivity was discovered in 1934. In that same year, Fermi and his co-workers in Italy prepared radioactive isotopes of iodine. Now recall that Compton's president of MIT spoke in this room in 1936 when he was asked the question. And the physiology studies that Roberts did with Hertz and I think Salter on rabbits, where they gave them tracer amounts of radioactive iodine, were in 38, following sort of the question and the availability in some limited amounts of iodine isotopes. So it goes on to say, the first reports on the results of the use of radioactive iodine as treatment for thyroid toxicosis were those of Hertz and Roberts, 1942, and Hamilton and Lawrence, 1942. These reports were made at the same meeting of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. The first mentioned based on 10 cases, the second mentioned based on three. Hertz and Roberts in 46 reported again on their series, which then numbered 29, with doses of radioiodine ranging from 3 to 21 millicuries given as a 12-hour isotope. That was I-130, and followed by courses of ordinary iodine. So after the doses were administered, inorganic iodine was the only antithyroid drug available. In the 30s, it was a while before thyureas came into it. That was around World War II, when McKenzie and Astwood sort of developed it in search of an antibiotic. Chapman and Evans, 1946, also studied the treated series of cases using heavier doses than Hertz and Roberts, namely 15 to 79 millicuries given as a 12-hour isotope and without other therapy. So the point is that if you look at these two articles and question who originated, you'll notice that the Hertz series started in 1941 and went through 43. And then Chapman, who was Hertz's student while Hertz was in the Navy, started in 43 and changed the protocol in terms of the dose and abandoning radioactive iodine. So I won't go on anymore, but I thought that this is a bit prescient because this book, which is the second edition, is a deaccession book from the U.S. Naval Hospital in Newport. And Lou um, and I would like to give this to Barbara and inscribed it on January 23rd, 2012. Dear Barbara, many thanks for sustaining the legacy of your father's immeasurable contribution to medicine, and it's from Lou and I. So come on up here and we'll give you this. Well, I must say those are two tough acts to follow. And I'm not going to discuss any of the uses of radioiodine and its discovery, but rather would like to address very promptly and easily the whole issue of anti-Semitism at Harvard Medical School. And I know that in the 20s at Harvard College, when President Lowell was the president, there was a very tight quota on the entrance of Jewish students into the Harvard College. And this has changed remarkably over the past many decades. And anecdotally, uh, at the Mass General, Ben Castleman was, a, was an outstanding pathologist and was kept as the acting chair of pathology at the Mass General for 12 years before he was finally appointed the chairman. So that I think that that sort of gives you a background of some of the problems that existed uh, at Harvard Medical School and at Harvard University in those days. That is all gone now, and I think we can sort of not re try not to remember those problems that occurred. And when I went to medical school at Hopkins, I, there was about a 10% quota 
uh, at that time, and I must say we were ahead of Harvard Medical School because we had 10% of the class were women. And at Harvard Medical School, there were essentially none at that time. So that I, I think that we should also look at the last 25 years at Harvard Medical School when at one time, within this period of time, five chairs of medicine and professors of medicine at Harvard Medical School at the Mass General, at that time the Peter Ben Brigham, the Beth Israel, the Mount Auburn, and the Cambridge Hospital were all Jewish. So that I think that one should try to remember a little bit the past, but I think that Harvard is certainly no longer has these kind of prejudices which existed without a question uh, in, in the earlier days. And my father-in-law was a thyroidologist and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and at the Beth Israel Hospital, and I know knew, uh, knew, knew, knew Dr. Hertz. And uh, he published a textbook on the thyroid uh, in 1955. And the introduction to my fa father-in-law, Sam Gargill's uh, book, was by Dr. Means. And I think that Dr. Means was an outstanding and remarkable gentleman who had none of these innate prejudices. And he wrote that Drs. Gargill and Lessies have given us a comprehensive, meticulous, and well-arranged text on the thyroid. They are well qualified to do this task, having had many years' experience in the field in the thyroid clinic at the Beth Israel Hospital. I have on several occasions visited this clinic and recognized its high standards of practice and study. The authors have covered the several diseases involving the thyroid gland thoroughly, and they have prefaced their remarks with a full account of the underlying physiology. So that I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Means, who was certainly the giant uh, in thyroidology in Boston, and, and, and certainly. And that I think we should look back on what happened in the 40s to Dr. Hertz, uh, only historically, and remember that things have changed. And I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Hertz and, and his colleague, uh, and to remind you that radioactive iodine still remains, in this country, the major therapy for hypothyroidism and in a, in a survey of American thyroidologists, about 70% have suggested that their first line of therapy for Graves' disease is radioactive iodine. So that it's certainly, we owe a lot to Dr. Hertz and his colleague for doing the initial physiology and, uh, in animals and then applying it uh, to humans. So that I want to thank Barbara for bringing this to everyone's attention. But again, I want to remind you that times have changed, and I think Harvard makes everyone feel extremely comfortable. Thank you. Saul Hertz's legacy is dynamic, profoundly affecting the field of nuclear medicine, countless generations of patients, and numerous institutions. To date, more than one million hyperthyroid patients have been treated successfully. Pulitzer Prize author, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, publicly thanked Dr. Hertz while explaining how his groundbreaking work established the first targeted cancer therapy. First of all, thank you for your father for inventing this. This actually saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of men and women. Um, the, the, the answer is thyroid cancer. That particular variant of thyroid cancer is very unique. Um, and it's because the thyroid happens to concentrate iodine. The thyroid happens to be a unique organ in our body which takes iodine and sucks it up and puts it inside it. It concentrates iodine, it's a little bag of iodine. And therefore, uh, if you make radioactive iodine, it becomes like a Trojan horse. Um, and it goes into the thyroid and the Trojan horse, in, because it's carrying radioactivity, will bombard the thyroid with radioactivity and thereby cure some of these variants of thyroid cancer. So, you, it's hard to imagine that exactly the same idea is going to apply to other cancers, but the principle of the Trojan horse, which is to somehow load a payload, an antibody, 
uh, to payload a chemical to get into an orbit.